what US courts think the GPL means so far. Um, so um, first thing, good little introduction. I'm gonna do a little bit of a vocabulary lesson uh, to explain why everything I say now really doesn't actually matter. Um, and then we'll go through, talk about some of the cases. Um, so I'm a lawyer, um, which makes sense. I talk about legal stuff. I work for Civic Actions. Um, they paid for my last trip to a conference, and I didn't use their slide deck. They're not paying for this trip, so I am going to use their slide deck. I figure <laughs> we'll just kind of like flop back and forth. Um, a little bit about me. I was a systems architect for about 17 years uh, before I became a lawyer. Um, and things to talk to me about besides IT and law. Um, I like to travel to historic locations, and I'm a camper. So you know, other questions. Um, so um, the, uh, the niceties of lawyers, like I'm definitely not your lawyer. Uh, and this is definitely not legal advice. I think that is, that's a true statement for basically everyone in the room. Uh, my coworkers at Civic Actions also know I am not your personal lawyer. Um, so what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna review several cases involving the GPL. Um, we're gonna talk about a few cases that did not involve the GPL, but I think are actually interesting in terms of what GP, it tells us about the GPL. Um, we're gonna talk about what the court said. So um, this is specifically about like rulings that courts have made involving free software cases. Um, and you know, just as a caution, none of these cases are actually fi the final word. I'm pretty sure I went through, and actually none of the cases we're gonna talk about are binding precedent or would any other court actually have to follow what they said here? It's just what the courts, when they were dealing with the GPL, decided to interpret it as. Um, and it's focused on US courts because we're in Boston, so I don't have to apologize for being US-centric. Um, when I go abroad, I have to apologize for that. So um, what we're not gonna talk about, um, we're not gonna talk about probably famous cases you may have heard if you're the kind of nerd that follows free software law. So we're not gonna talk about the GPL violations cases. We're not gonna talk about AFPA versus EDU4, which is a French case. We're not gonna talk about the BusyBus cases or the FFS cases. Definitely not gonna talk about Helwig or Patrick McCarty. Um, that's none of, the, none of those cases are we're gonna talk about. Mostly because uh, you know, a lot of those are not US cases. So law is different else there. Or in a lot of those cases, the court never actually said anything. Um, court never said anything in any of the busy box cases. They were just lawsuits that were brought and then they were settled, but the court never actually told us what they were gonna do with them. Um, so short vocabulary lesson. So um, really important when you're talking about legal cases and what courts say, there's two things that lawyers are looking at. We're looking for the holding in a case, which is basically the stuff that a judge says in a case to reach the, the legally operative outcome in the case. Like they're essential to getting to this conclusion. And then there's orbiter dictum. Lawyers often call it, just call it dicta or dictum. That's the stuff that the court says that they didn't have to say to justify their legal conclusion. So it's often very much a hard problem. So one of the ways that the Supreme Court wiggles its way out of things it used to say in the past is something that was quite obviously a holding suddenly becomes dicta later on when it becomes embarrassing. Um, so sometimes it is challenging and exactly what lawyers are, are arguing about is, was this previous court statement dicta or the holding? Um, for the most part, what we're gonna be looking at today are gonna be dicta, so this wouldn't require any other courts to follow it. Um, so, and why do these things matter? So US courts, uh, common law courts, so Canada, Australia, um, England, technically not any of those civil law countries, um, operate underneath precedent. So we make laws every time we go to court. When a judge says something, they're basically saying, in this case, the law is this as applied to these facts. And then another court comes along, they look back at what other courts and said, like, well, this is kind of like that case. And since we did that then, we're gonna keep doing that um, just to stay consistent. That's one of the ways we make a law in common law countries. So there's two kinds, there's binding precedent and there's persuasive precedent. So basically the difference is, is binding precedent, you have to do it if it's binding on you. Persuasive is just something you have to follow. It's very complicated. Um, I was a, a clerk at the appellate court in the state of Connecticut for a while, and the way that they explained it to me was that if the US Supreme Court said it or the Connecticut Supreme Court said it, you have to follow it. Um, if they didn't say anything about it, then what I want you to do is start on the East Coast and work your way to the West Coast, first go to the federal circuits and then drop down to the state courts involved in that and move your way west until you find arguments that support the position we wanna take. And when you get to the California border, when you get to the California border, stop. 
okay. Um, so they told me what they wanted the case to say, and then I went out and I found precedent to, to support that. But that's basically how it works. So what we're talking about here is persuasive precedent for the most part, because none of this would actually be binding in other courts, or at least I don't think it would, but I'm sure another lawyer would argue with me about it. Um, so the first case we're going to talk about actually is probably the only one that maybe is binding precedent, um, planetary motion versus textplosion. Um, this is a case involving two email service providers in the mid-90s, um, and they both had email services they wanted to call cool mail. Um, one of them, which was actually kind of interesting, I would like to know if anyone knows anything about it, it was you could call up a phone number and it would like tell you if you had your internet email. Um, you could like check your email that way, and I don't know what that meant. Like it was 1995, so it was, like was someone checking your inbox and like reading the emails to you, or <laughs> like would like maybe a computer would tell you like at that point like oh you have five new emails. Like I think you probably could have done that with a computer in 1995, but that's basically what was going on. Um, and in the case, they were talking about a GPL license program called CoolMail. So it was created by a developer called Dara. Um, and CoolMail was distributed underneath the GPL. It was actually distributed in SUSE, if anyone remembers early SUSE distributions. Dara never sold CoolMail. He never provided commercial support around CoolMail. Um, and he only distributed it to an unknown number of technically skilled Unix users. Um, so the question at the time was, who had the right to use the word cool mail to describe their service? And Dara had created this email client before any of this stuff had happened. He'd been streaming the GPL. And what the court decided, or said, I didn't really decide. I was actually kind of confused why they were talking about this, because it didn't seem to factor into their decision. Um, distribution of software over the internet is worthy of trademark protection. And the fact that the GPL licensed software is commonly distributed without charge is no barrier to trademark rights. Um, so this isn't actually really surprising. Like, I think most lawyers who work in this space would be like, why would I even look up a case for this? Um, but I thought it was actually kind of interesting, because one of the things that they pointed out was for trademark rights in the United States, we usually think of selling things. Um, trademarks are about protecting names and brands and commerce. But you don't usually sell GPL software, right? Because that's like a sure way not to be successful in business is charging people to use your GPL licensed software. Um, but the fact that it was distributed in commerce using it in commerce, distributing the channels of commerce, was enough for trademark protection. And the fact that it was distributed on the internet, well, that was national distribution. It's not like he was handing out copies of CDs to his friends. It wasn't just some local hobby in you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, or something like that. It had, it had na national distribution, right? That got him priority rights underneath the trademark name. And the fact that it was underneath the GPL actually wasn't a barrier to getting a trademark in it. It helped. It showed that he was trying to control the use of the name. Um, I was like, oh, well, you know, that's the case. We don't really talk about that much. So, you know, just for comprehensiveness, like GPL, good for protecting trademark names, or at least it helps. It definitely helps there, right? So, um, for any of you running a free software project who are desperate to come up with explanation or examples of how you're using it in commerce, you just have to show people that you're distributing it widely, and publication on the internet is one of the ways you can do that. It's not legal advice. Um, so, another early case. Um, this one is often not talked about by lawyers, mostly because it was a pro se case, which means the software developer who brought the case did not have an attorney. Um, but it had an appellate court opinion uh, written by a fairly well-known judge named Judge Easterbrook. Um, and it was, a, I thought, a pretty good explanation of how the, you know, what the GPL is actually happening. But Wallace basically said that um, the GPL was a conspiracy um, to fix the price of software at zero. Um, <laughs> And by basically said he, he literally say he, the allegation literally was that IBM and Red Hat and the Free Software Foundation were conspiring to fix the price of software at zero. And that was an antitrust violation because it was price fixing and that should be prohibited by that. Um, and the court, so what I mentioned what court said about this, the court reasoned that the GPL keeps software free forever. Now, we're at a Free Software Foundation conference, so let's clarify what free means, right? So I'm pretty sure what Judge Easterbrook meant here was free as in gratis, right? Because he's, he's an economics kind of legal dude, right? He doesn't actually care about human beings as far as I can tell. He cares about dollars and cents. Um, but so that's what he's focused on. We all have our priorities in life. Um, but he actually kind of 
Yeah, I think he got the economic model around this too, right? Is that like, if you're gonna be using the GPL, you're basically making the economic cost of your software zero, right? Because it's really hard to charge people to get a copy of GPL licensed software when they can just get it from one of their friends. So they actually understood the economic impact of the GPL. Um, and, and actually, what was interesting about that was like, since it's gonna keep prices at zero, there was no role in antitrust law. Like, this wasn't actually a bad thing because the point of antitrust law is to help consumers. One of the ways you help consumers is bringing prices down. Well, if the GPL is gonna keep the price at zero, well, that's great for consumers, right? Um, he did have some cautions though, right? Software is not maintained or improved eventually becomes obsolete, right? Which for anyone who's tried to build a free software business, um, they know that actually is an obstacle. I'm like, oh, well, if I can't charge for my software when I'm distributing it to GPL, how am I gonna make money, right? So I think he correctly identified a challenge, right? You can't charge people licensing fees. How are you gonna pay for this? Um, but the GPL is not a restraint on trade. It's a cooperative agreement that facilitates the production of software, which, I mean, I was literally have a conversation yesterday in the hallway where someone from the Free Software Foundation staff described to me as, well, that's basically what the GPL is. It's a cooperative agreement. Like, you don't really need a lot of other legal agreements out there. Just do it underneath the GPL, and now you have an agreement about how you're gonna operate. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Judge Easterbrook got that back in 2006. So judges kind of get the, the operation of how this thing is gonna work. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so another free software case, um, this is like the big granddaddy case in free software law. All free software attorneys know about this case. Jacobson versus Katzer. Um, it's not a GPL case, it's an artisan case, um, which I think most people know. Many people don't know that as soon as this case concluded, he switched his license to GPL. I think probably because if anyone's read that license, well, you know why. Um, <laughs> Um, but what they, the interesting thing about this case basically was that free software licenses are enforceable. Um, and, and it was actually kind of interesting you read the case because there really wasn't actually a dispute about whether or not free software licenses were enforceable as contracts. Um, but the appellate court in this case decided that free software uh, licenses were enforceable as copyright infringement cases. Um, so there's two reasons why you can sue somebody. You can either sue them because they breached a contract with you, which is what the free software license would be, or you can sue them for copyright infringement because they no longer had a copyright license to use the software when they stopped following the license. Um, so, and that's really actually important here, and there's like this really weird esoteric argument about... Sure. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting, now that we're back on this slide too, that I find interesting about this case is that courts actually pick up on some things about what these licenses mean. Um, sometimes I think this is underappreciated by both attorneys and software developers, but the thing that they that got um, Jacobson sued in this case, I'm sorry, Katzer sued in this case was, um, he didn't include the author's name, didn't include copyright notices, didn't include references to the copying file. Um, didn't include a, uh, an indication that J the um, free software developers were the source of the copy files, and didn't include a description of how the files were changed. So if you're a free software developer in the audience, um, when you think about compliance with licenses, are you mostly focused on making sure there's a copy of the license in there? And do you ever actually pay attention to whether or not you're describing your modifications or if you're keeping all those copyright notices in place? Um, because I, I tend to think that's underappreciated, which is why everyone freaks out about like, oh my God, you might get sued for violating a copyleft license. Um, just use a permissive license, you'll never get sued for that. Um, the thing they got sued for though was, these are pretty much all things that are in a permissive license as well. So I know I kind of, I'm waiting for someone to get sued over a permissive license because that seems like a really easy thing to do. Um, and actually another part of the case that didn't go to the appellate court was, um, they were also sued for misuse of copyright management information underneath the DMCA, um, which turns out to be a really common thing to sue people for underneath free culture licenses. Um, doesn't matter if it's permissive or not. If you're not including the licensing information, the copyright notices, like that's a really common way to get sued. Um, so pay attention to that stuff if you're a software developer. The licenses care about that and courts apparently care about that. It's very frequent to come up in cases. Um, so uh, this, the Zimpleware cases were like so interesting when they came out. There's, and there's so many of them. So I'm gonna kind of explain what happened. Um, there's at least 
four cases involved here. There's actually many more that it spawned, and litigation's still ongoing. I think Ford is currently getting sued as a descendant of these cases, Ford Motor Company. Um, so what basically happened was there's a company called Versada, and they sued Ameriprise, which is a big financial services firm, in a Texas state court. Um, we're going to talk about um, jurisdiction between state and federal courts. So everyone's excited about that kind of stuff? Like, buckle up. This is fun. Um, so, and what they sued them for was a declaration that they had the right to terminate the contract. They didn't sue for breach of contract. They didn't sue claiming that the other person had violated the contract. Versada just said that we have the right to terminate contract. I think what was going on was Versada was trying to get some leverage in negotiations and say, hey, court said we're allowed to cancel this contract, and if we did, you'd be screwed. Um, and what happened was Ameriprise was like, oh, yeah, we're canceling the contract. Um, which is like, oh, okay, well, all right, well, now the big boys are playing rough here, right? And then they countered sued for breach of contract, because Ameriprise canceled the contract claiming that Versada had breached the contract. And in the course of discovery, they discovered that Versada had used Zimpleware's GPL licensed software. I think it was XML parsing library. Um, and so they told Zimpleware, like, as anyone would do, be like, hey, we found out somebody was suing us probably should get sued by someone else. Let's go tattle on them, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what I would do if my brother did that to me. So, um, so what ended up happening was they said, OK, well, we're going to countersue you for breaching the terms of the GPL as a contract claim. Uh, I was like, OK, well, that's kind of interesting. Versada said, like, well, lawyers have to make billable hours. Be like, you can't sue us in state court for breach of the GPL as a contract. GPL is not a contract. It's a software license. It's a copyright license. That can only be done in a federal court. So we have to go over to federal court. Uh, and the federal court basically said, actually, I think they can. So you should go back to state court. Like, you can sue in the GPL <laughs> for a breach of contract. Um, and oh, by the way, you didn't do your pleadings right. We realize it's a technicality. If you want to, you can adjust what you claimed in your case, and then you can bring it back to federal court. But um, go do that first. Um, and then Zimpleware is like, oh, this is really interesting. You know what we should do? We should sue Versada. Oh, and Ameriprise, because hey, why the hell not? Um, and then Versada removed the case back to federal court a second time, which was just weird, because nothing actually happened. That ended with like no paperwork came happening, but I'm sure lawyers made a lot of money off of it, which is good. You should pay your lawyers a lot, like a lot. <laughs> um, and then Zimpleware said, like, well, we're suing people. Um, we should sue Versada and Ameriprise again. Oh, I just noticed a typo. Awesome. Um, we should sue Versada and Ameriprise again, but you know who else has money? People like Ameriprise. Because financial services have a ton of money, and it turns out Versada's customer list includes a lot of them. So let's sue a bunch of them for patent infringement as well. Um, so I don't actually, you know, who knows what happened there? Who cares? A bunch of corporations suing each other doesn't really matter. I'm sure a bunch of people made a lot of money. Um, but what was interesting that happened in these cases, right? So um, when Versada took Ameriprise to federal court the first time, the question was, was the GPL contract claim preempted by copyright law, so it could only be brought in federal courts. And the standard for that is, is, does the claim, does the cause of action fall within the subject matter of copyright? And if it does, are those rights equivalent to any of the rights, exclusive rights of federal copyright law? Which basically means, if you're going to sue somebody and what you have to claim is exactly the same as a copyright infringement, you can only do that in federal court. But if you have to say they did something else on top of that, you could also sue them in state court. And as it turns out, for a breach of co uh, copyright, the court held the copyleft scheme is not entirely distinct from copyright law, but the viral component, I apologize to the Free Software Foundation, I am quoting the court here and I want to report it accurately, is separate and distinct from a copyright obligation. Copyright law imposes no free software obligations. Right? Um, so basically what that means is, is that the copyleft obligations underneath the GPL, in this court's view, can at least be viewed as a contract claim. 
Um, and for lawyers, this is actually really important when you're talking about copyright infringement versus a contract claims or different reasons why you could sue people because there's different remedies that you might actually get in court, right? So if you're going to sue for copyright infringement, you can often get like preliminary injunctions that say, oh, you can't do that again and we're going we're to get a court to tell you not to, right? There could be criminal consequences if you violate that. For a contract claim, typically what happens is like, all right, well, just keep ignoring the contract, that's screwed, we're past that, we're just talking about money damages at this point, right? So, like, we'll just figure this out later and it's all going to be about money. So there's, it, may, it matters a lot. Like, if you want a lot of money, like, contract claims are great. Um, there's lots of different ways you can get a lot of money out of it. If you want to stop somebody from doing something, contract claims aren't that great. Um, you can do both. The court here didn't say that you couldn't sue for copyright infringement, it just made clear that you could also sue for breach of contract. So if you want to sue someone in a Massachusetts state court, um, you can point to this case and say, like, no, I don't want to go to federal court. I want to sue in a Massachusetts state court, too, because it also affects where you can sue. Um, so um, the other interesting thing about this was the court then went on to say that because contract claims are most appropriately addressed in a state court, not in a federal court, we are not going to address the issue of whether or not Ameriprise, as a third-party beneficiary, has standing to sue for breach of the GPL. So I don't know how many people have ever talked to a lawyer about enforcing GPL claims. Um, I used to work at the Software Freedom Law Center. We used to have people come to us all the time and say, hey, someone's violating the GPL. I want to sue them. And our first question was, well, are you a copyright holder? Because if you're not a copyright holder, you probably don't have standing to sue enforce that. Well, in this court, it said, we're specifically not answering the question of whether or not Ameriprise, as a non-copyright holder in Zimpleware software, has the ability to sue that. That's an appropriate question for state court. So uh, to me, what that says as an attorney is if anyone ever tells you that's an absolute hard rule that only copyright holders are allowed to sue for the GPL, I go, well, maybe that's true, but I mean, there's at least one court in Texas that thinks that's an open question. Uh, excuse me? The federal court said that they would not answer the question because it's the kind of question a state court should answer underneath state law. Um, and I think that was really interesting. So, um, so on to more lawsuits. So Zimpleware is suing Versada and its friend Ameriprise. Now they're going to sue them for copyright infringement on the claim that they violated the GPL. Um, so in this case, um, they tried once. In the same case, they made a motion to get a preliminary injunction. Remember I said that one of the things you can get with a uh, copyright infringement claim is an injunction. An injunction is basically an order from a court saying you have to stop using, in this case, the software um, because you don't have a license for it. And if you ignore me, I'm a court, I can send you to jail. Still wondering what it looks like when a court sends a corporation to jail, but I bet you it's hilarious. Um, so what was interesting about this was that Zimpleware tried twice. The first time their motion was denied like really quickly because I think they had bad lawyers. Um, the second time, the court was like, ah, well, you know, let's just give Versata some time to write a software patch to remove the GPL code and install it on all of their user bases. And then a couple months went by, and Zimpleware said they didn't do it yet. And the court's like, well, you know, let's just give them some more time. Um, and then the case ultimately settled for undisclosed terms. So what I think is interesting about this, right, is a big fear that a lot of corporations have is that if we accidentally ever get any some GPL code inside of our software, all of a sudden, all of the code that that's mixed with is going to have to be released underneath the GPL. And I think a lot of free software advocates say, like, yep. Um, <laughs> And as it turns out, there was at least one court that was kind of like, well, maybe, but you know, let's just see what happens, right? And that went on for at least a year until they settled. Um, I assume Zimpleware got a ton of money out of that case. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so the other interesting thing about that was um, they also talked about, you know, Ameriprise was the customer, right? Like, Versata gave them a copy of GPL licensed software. So you might be wondering, well, how did Zimpleware argue that Ameriprise violated the software? They were the user, right? Like, 
Software freedom, right? It's all about users' rights, maximizing the freedom of the users of the software, including corporations, right? I'm actually a big advocate for that. I know that's sometimes controversial, but including commercial uses. Ameriprise using commercial user of GPL licensed software, what's wrong with that? So what was interesting about that was, again, Zimpleware's attorneys are not that great. Um, but they said, oh, well, they used, they distributed it to their employees. Well, is that a violation of the GPL? If a company is using GPL so licensed software and it gives copies to its own employees, it's a compiled version but doesn't give them the source code? Is this GPL2? This is GPL v2. I think most, most attorneys would say no, right? Um, and so they're like, all right, well, we'll try again. We'll try to say something else. And they try something else. And the, finally, the third time they said it right, where the court said, I'm like, yep. Now I believe you. You have now alleged behavior that Ameriprise could have done. Not that Ameriprise did, but you're at least claiming that Ameriprise did behavior that would have violated the distribution requirements of the GPL. And what they had to say was that the majority of Ameriprise's financial advisors, these are the employees they distributed the GPL license software to, the majority of Ameriprise financial advisors are not Ameriprise employees. Right? So this basically, in, in not so direct words, has adopted the theory that most free software attorneys would say is the distribution requirement for underneath GPL follows agency law in the United States, which is basically if you're a cor corporation, you can use the GPL, you can give copies to your employees, you don't need to follow the requirement, distribution requirements as long as your own employees, but if you hire an independent contractor or a third-party vendor to help you with that and you give them copies, Nope, that is now copy, that counts as distribution, right? So before the court would let them sue the user of the software for violating the GPL, they had to allege that's what happened, is that you gave a copy to a third party, that you were not only a user, but you were also a distributor in the sense that you gave it to a third party who's not your employees. Underneath this theory, this judge would have said, uh, I'm not surprised your company fired you. <laughs> why did, why did Zimpleware sue Ameriprise as well? Yes. Oh, no, no. In this case, Zimpleware sued both Versada and Ameriprise. But didn't they dismiss that from copyright infringement? They sued both of them for copyright infringement. But didn't they in the past say that Ameriprise could not be part of the case because they were just a third party non-call? Oh, no. It was Ameriprise. They were alleging Ameriprise gave it to yet other third parties, the unnamed individuals. So Zimpleware is claiming that Ameriprise has a copy of the GPL licensed software, and because not all of its financial advisors are employees of Ameriprise, and Ameriprise gave them a copy of the GPL licensed software, they had to follow the distribution requirements. So that would take away a little bit the, the idea that they were basically saying that because it's a, in this case, Ameriprise is an entity, it cannot uh, distribute copies of its own internal... No, that was the distinction it was making. It can distribute to its own internal employees, but not to third-party contractors. Uh, no, well, that's, that was the case. Versada wasn't claiming they didn't distribute it. They definitely did. Zimbleware was claiming Ameriprise also distributed it because it gave it to third parties. Um, so in the meantime, there was a patent infringement case. Um, so, um, I mean, this was like big money, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so what was interesting about this case, um, because an express license is a defense to patent infringement, right? Like, that's a good reason. Um, simple, it decided that Zimpleware needs to prove um, that the, all of these financial companies didn't have a license uh, and that to make sure they didn't have a license, I mean, they would have had to have distributed. They would have had violated the GPL, right? So the implication of that is, is that if they complied with the GPL, they did have a license. Sharing software with independent contractors working with the customers alone does not constitute distribution. Put another way, this is effectively internal distribution. Internal distribution is not enough to breach the GPL, right? So this is, a, this is what we're talking about, right? Like you can do the internal distribution, 
but if you do the external distribution, you have to follow the distribution requirements. So this is actually add a little bit more nuance because I'm not exactly sure what the facts are. I'm not actually sure that the lawyers on either, and any of these representatives knew what the facts were. Um, but it also kind of suggested that if you had vendors working inside of your company, maybe that would count as internal distribution depending upon what that relationship was. But if they were somewhere else, I see some heads going like, eh, I'm like, I don't know. But you know, I, mean, I can kind of think of that though, right? It's like, I work at a company, sometimes we have independent contractors. If we've got a scrum team with six people and then we pull somebody in onto the exact same scrum team and they're hacking on the same code base, you can't actually tell the difference except for the fact that someone in HR knows. Like, is that internal distribution or not? So this, this court is looking at that going like, well, this is where kind of the line is. Like, maybe, maybe not. But the really interesting thing about this was um, in this same case, they kind of summarize what the GPL requirements were, right? So you guys can read them up here. Any changes made to the code must carry notice stating that the files were changed. Does everyone do that when they modify GPL license software? Every file that you modified, you made a note about what you changed? Do you think a federal judge uh, knows what source control is and Git comments are? No. Um, <laughs> Any code created or derived from the GPL protected software must also be licensed underneath the GPL. Um, copyright notices must be printed or displayed when the code is running. Um, that's a shorthand summary. It's not an unfair summary, not exactly what the license says. And when, the distributed, when distributed program code must be accompanied by the complete machine readable source code. I actually think this is a pretty good summary of GPL v2. I mean, you can argue about it, but for like a judge with the facts he's dealing with, I'm like, yeah, that's not bad. That's a good offhanded explanation for it. Um, and all four conditions must be met, and the GPL requires strict compliance. Um, every mere word means something in a judicial opinion. It didn't say compliance, it said strict compliance. I think that's interesting, too. Um, um, and oh, also direct licensing works. Um, so in GPL, the, the mere fact that you have a copy of the software gives you the license to the software. Some people think that's a little weird, right? Like, we need contracts, direct agreements. What happens if somebody in the chain of custody, a distribution violates the license? Um, well, according to this court, um, third-party customers of that original IC retain the right to use Zimpleware software as long as that customer itself does not breach the license. So it's nice that that direct licensing model works. So that's good to know. It's a nice little toolbox that free software lawyers have in their their, their case when we're doing things. Um, and after, uh, dish, after considering arguments, the judge in the patent case decided that it actually agreed with the distribution interpretation obligations for the GPL in the copyright case. So we have two courts who are looking at each other going like, well, I don't know what this means, but that judge, what they said about distribution seems to make sense. Um, so this might actually be the kind of thing that we're going to talk about, that internal versus external distribution is probably going to be a way that courts are going to look at this. Um, there's a question in the back. Is your question still relevant? Uh, yeah, I was wondering about uh, the distinction between compliance and strict compliance. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it would be kind of like um, you said you were going to clean your room. You'd be like, well, yeah, I picked up all my clothes off the floor. I'm like, yeah, but there's still a pizza box. Um, <laughs> I'm like, well, I kind of complied. I'm like, yeah, strict compliance. And then you pick up the pizza box and you're like, no, seriously, like underneath your bed, there's like a three or four soda cans. Get those two. That's strict compliance. I don't know. What, what do you think it means? I don't know. Look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> um, oh, and also GPL2 contains a patent clause. So customer defendants are free to use uh, Zimpleware software underneath GPL. Um, as long as they didn't distribute the software in violation of the GPL. And the part of the license in GPL v2 they pointed to, activities other than copying, distribution, and modification are not covered by this license. They're outside the scope. The act of running the program is not restricted. That is the patent license inside of GPL. So anyone who tells you that a free software license doesn't have a patent grant in it because it doesn't say, I license you a patent right to use this software underneath this license, I want to say to them, like, but did it say you could use it? Um, because if the license says you could use the software, this court's going to say, like, yep, you're allowed to run the software. You got a license to run the software. That's probably a patent license. Um, I know that's probably controversial. Um, oh, and artifacts. I actually thought this one was really cool because I really like contract law in law school. Um, uh, so artifacts. Uh, does anyone know artifacts? Um, they're the company behind uh, Ghost Script. Um, They've got a bunch of other lawsuits that are going on that no one ever talks about. But I'm not going to talk about those because courts never ever comment on it. But they commented on this one. 
Um, so they were suing, I think, a South Korean company who made yet another Office suite and included a copy of the GPL version of GoScript in the Office suite, probably to make PDF files, something like that. Um, and one of the things that the South Korean company said was, um, well, we never actually agreed to the terms of the GPL, so you can't sue us for breach of contract. Um, <laughs> and the judge in that uh, case said that um, defendant contends plaintiff's reliance on the unsigned GNU GPL. Notice they did GNU GPL. Who, who, does anyone know what the G in GPL stands for? <laughs> right? It's not GNU. <laughs> Right. I know you know, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I don't always get that right, I'll admit. If I get that wrong, correct me. Sometimes I screw that up, too. So it's OK if you do. Um, is, uh, fails to plausibly demonstrate mutual assent. That is the existence of a contract. Not so. <laughs> I love that. I love when courts are really succinct in the point. To agree to a contract, you don't need to sign a piece of paper. Right? The fancy term that lawyers use is mutual assent. You have to demonstrate mutual assent. Signature is one way of doing it. It is not the only way of doing that. So um, the allegations sufficiently plead, uh, plead the existence of the contract. So what were the allegations pled? Well, basically that they knew the software was licensed beneath the GPL, and they used it, and that made a contract. Um, so as long as the person that's using the GPL licensed software knows, about, knows that it's licensed to the GPL, there's a really good chance you have a contract. Uh, I say really good trance because now there's like a whole bunch of other stuff. Like it'd be really hard to sue like a 12 year old underneath that theory, but it's another, another topic. Um, so, you know, it's, you can sue them underneath uh, contract theory and it doesn't matter if they signed or not. So I thought it was actually really interesting. So I'm getting pretty close to my time. Um, so I have bonus cases, um, but if anyone has any questions now, I'm happy to do that. We can take all the time on, on questions. Sure. So he's asking the difference between how is it different between what happened with the artifact and the South Korean company being a contract and then like the terms of service for an end user, I'm assuming on like a, on a SaaS software as a service as a software substitute. Um, I think I have that right. Um, how is that different and those not being enforceable? Right. Um, so there's um, another judge who's philosophically akin to Judge Easterbrook. Um, who wrote a case called Pro CD? No, wait, Judge Eastbrook did Pro CD. Um, there, in law, there's a theory about browser wrap, click wrap, and um, oh, what's the other one? Click shrink wrap, shrimp wrap, um, which basically has it talks about like when do you when is there good notice to the end user that they should be aware that these are the terms of the contract and therefore the use of the software constituted a mutual assent to it. Um, Generally, I would say the law is probably not settled on that. So the answer to your question is, I don't know. Um, but it would be something along the lines of, like, for you to agree to a contract, you should have at least been reasonably aware or had the opportunity to look at the terms of the contract, right? So um, when the people on the sales team at my company are just like, oh, here's a contract, I'll sign it. Um, it doesn't matter they didn't actually read it. Um, they agreed to the terms of the contract. The fact that they didn't read it is just kind of reckless. Um, they had the opportunity to. But when you go to a website and you, know, you could have clicked on about this company, went down to legal terms, and then clicked on like software licenses, but you didn't do that, instead you just used their software, well, you kind of hid the terms. It wasn't really reasonable for people to like skirt your entire website to find what legal terms you happen to have. You probably didn't agree to a contract there because it wasn't reasonable for you to be put on notice about those terms, right? So companies now are very careful, depending upon what their lawyers want to tell them, about how visible that link to terms of service has to be before it's enforceable. And then you can get into a whole thing about like what you're allowed to put in those terms of services, which is a whole different area of law. That answer your question? If anybody else has any questions, just come down here uh, to the microphone so that the microphone is straight in here as well. If you need a microphone brought up, just raise your hand and let us know. I have bonus cases too. Okay. Do you have to subscribe online? Yeah. Uh, maybe? I think there's like a text file with a bunch of typos and a GitHub repo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
uh, it occurs to me that the uh, distinction between internal employees and uh, 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 and uh, contractors uh, is going to apply to your lawyers too. I mean, hmm. An outside law firm. Well, one no lawyers are special. Rules don't apply to us. <laughs> Um, that's all, that, but that's also kind of true. Um, so lawyers are, have a, have, are a certain, a special kind of agent and fiduciary to, to corporations and to individuals as well. So we do tend to get special privileges here. So I actually would be really surprised if you had a normal legal relationship where you're like, ah, I'm getting sued for a GPL violation. Here's a copy of the binary. And then like they tacked on and be like, and on top of that, you then distributed the binary to your lawyer as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I think that would be probably kind of surprising, but like it wouldn't, I, not to say that like if a law firm were involved in a commercial transaction that they would have immunity. Um, but yeah, specifically around a lawyer, I think courts would probably cut them a little bit of slack, right? You gotta protect your own, right? Um. Hi. So uh, really interesting, like a hundred interesting points, but it seems like there are about a thousand questions that aren't really resolved. Oh yeah. Um, so for an audience like this, I mean, what is the, what do you recommend as sort of the best path of action where we can help to resolve more of these questions? Is the, is the answer that the FSF files more lawsuits and we push on, on certain buttons? Is the answer that wow. we sit and wait? Is the answer that we target certain courts or certain countries, or um, what do I mean, we do to make this better? Well, I guess it depends on what you think is better, right? So I think there are some there are some people out there that think we should obviously be suing more, right? I did not talk about some of the lawsuits that I think are probably controversial in the community. Um, for me, the takeaway from these cases is, is that for the most part, actually the courts were coming to the outcomes that we expected, right? Internal versus external distribution. It's basically, I think, what most people expected, right? The lawyers who were advising around these licenses did a decent job around it. Um, I think there's probably some surprise there is the fact that a lot of lawyers who operate in this space and a lot of software developers who are interested in licensing tend to think of these as copyright only licenses. The fact that courts are not only like, willing to treat them as contracts, but like they actually kind of take that as a given, um, might, you know, might change about how we think about these. There's the possibility for things like third party beneficiary. I think most free software attorneys would say like, oh, you can't really do that. And we're like, well, I, I think you probably could. Um, do you want to do that? Um, I don't know. One of the things that might be to take away from these cases is that if you say we shouldn't sue about free software licenses, well, you can believe that, but people are, so you might want to calculate that into whether or not you're going to sue about a free software license because someone's going to, right? So um, Zimpleware, they're a free software developer, I guess. They had a company out there. They also had four or five patents, um, and they wanted to make a bunch of money. So we had a lawsuit, pretty long lawsuit, that had a lot of important points about what the GPL meant between um, Zimpleware, free software developer that wanted a lot of money, not compliance, um, tested the limits of the theory of distribution um, that challenged the community's understanding of it. And the people who defended the community's understanding of distribution was Ameriprise. And I don't think Ameriprise gives a crap about software freedom. Um, so is that who you want to bring the lawsuits or do people want to participate in the lawsuits? Um, I don't see anyone in the room that'll like go come up to me in the hallway and say you shouldn't have said that. but. I am probably more willing to sue about these licenses or think we maybe we should consider suing about them more than some people. But yeah, it's an open question, but it's happening. <laughs> Apparently Richard agrees with something I just said. Uh, <laughs> Do you think that all this uncertainty around the case law is one of the inhibiting factors for corporations uh, adopting any sort of free software? One of the reasons they treat it as completely toxic? No, 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 no. So at this point in time, um, all right, just answer this question and I have to stop. Corporations know, software companies know they can't make software and not use free software. They want to call it open source, but they know they can't be profitable without doing it. The reason why they don't want to sue about it is that they're scared about the outcome and they like the current state of things and they don't want to upset the apple cart. But they're risk adverse. All right, that's my time. Thank you very much.